All right, I made it back safely from my trip, currently in self-quarantine, but that's not going to stop me from showing you guys how to create this iPad lettering brush in Procreate using the new brush studio. It's inspired by the color changing ability of the Chameleon and takes advantage of the new color dynamics feature in Procreate 5. And yeah, this is how I made it. So when it comes to brush creation, the two most important elements are number one, the shape, and number two, the grain. I also talk about this in my other tutorials. If you haven't watched those, I highly recommend you check them out as it helps to understand the fundamentals. But yeah, again, shape and grain are going to be the ones we're looking at in the beginning. For this brush, I'm going to use a shape that's actually already in the Procreate library, but for the grain, I'm going to use a custom one I made in Photoshop. If you're wondering why specifically this grain, it's because after hours of experimentation, that's just a combination that worked out. These two combined gave me the best results in terms of feel and texture. Now that we have the base, let's take a closer look in the new brush studio. And what it may seem overwhelming at first is actually not that different from previous versions, and it's definitely an improvement in many ways. We have this clear division, on the left the generous settings, in the middle the more specific ones for fine tuning, and on the right we now have this large area to test out the brush we are currently working with. And it's all live so all the changes you make are immediately effective which is pretty damn cool. Right now we see this is nowhere near the outcome we want to have but that's also totally fine because we'll go over each setting and try to adjust along the way to have this brush we used in the beginning of this video. So first we have the stroke path which includes spacing, streamline, jitter, and fall off. We don't need spacing as we don't want our brush to have spaces during execution. Streamline, very subjective. I keep mine at around 30 to 40%. I don't like it if the stroke is too smooth and corrected. Jitter, don't need that as we're going for a cleaner look and fall off also doesn't seem to be necessary. And that's the thing, while creating brushes, you should always, 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 always have a rough idea of what your brush is supposed to be. In this case, I wanted mine to be a Tombow brush with the ability to change colors every time I start a new stroke. Next, taper settings. Refers to the beginning as well as the end of the stroke, whether you want the tip to be more sharp or more dull. And for this, we're only looking at the pressure taper since I assume most people watching this are planning on using the brush with their Apple Pencil instead of their fingers. And yeah, we have this nice visual interface which shows us exactly how much sharper or how much more dull we want our strokes to be. You can also link these so the changes you make on one side are exactly the same as on the other. And then there are size, opacity, pressure, and tip settings. I'm only going to bump up the pressure a little bit because whenever I create a stroke, I want it to naturally thin out faster at the end, just like a real brush. Because you know, a real brush usually doesn't have a thick ending, so I'm going to keep it sharp. Tip animation, I personally like to see whenever the taper settings are applied, so I'm turning that on, but you can turn that off depending on your preference. Now the shape, for this I recommend bumping up the spacing in the stroke section so you can see all the changes more clearly. And for a basic lettering brush, by choosing the right shape we already have, I'd say 99% of the things we need here. We don't need our shape to scatter, to rotate, to stamp more than once at each point, and also definitely not to jitter or randomize the rotation of our shape. I mean, you can always try it out yourself, but from my experience, it's usually not that helpful. Azimuth can be useful since it allows for pen manipulation, but we'll keep it off for now, it's more relevant for black leather brushes. And you can now flip the shape both horizontally and vertically, but we'll stick to simply rotating for our example and the shape filtering is improved. And yeah, all the new settings such as pressure roundness, tilt roundness, they just don't seem all too practical for us at the moment, especially for people who are just starting out. I have an article up that explains the settings in more detail, which will soon also be updated. But for now, I think it's best to just focus on the essentials. Which leads us next to the grain. First of all, we're going to set it to moving, and this is also pretty much just pure experimentation. And after doing that, these are the settings I came up with. This makes the grain look the best in my opinion. Movement is 7%, scale 15, zoom is 63, rotation 0, depth set to max, depth minimum and jitter is 0, offset jitter is turned on, and blend mode is set to multiply. We're going to increase the brightness to 45% and contrast to 25% since we do want it to pop in the dark, and no filtering this time. Not quite there yet, but we're getting closer. Rendering, we're going to set to uniform blending and the flow all the way up to max. Wet edges are also set at 100% and burnt edges set to zero. Since that's zero, the burnt edges mode doesn't really matter and the overall blend modes will be normal. 
Lastly, luminance blending will be turned on because I found it helps with the colors in the dark. That was rendering, now let's go over to the wet mix section. This one's especially important for watercolor brushes, but I also found that it just helps with the general flow of the brush. I personally like the feeling of watercolor brushes in Procreate, so I'm going to enable everything except for dilution and wetness jitter because that kind of messes up the luminance we've been working on in the rendering section. And if we look up the definition of dilute, it all makes sense. So yeah, here are the numbers. Charge is 34%, attack 70%, Pull again, 34, and the grade is set to smooth. Et voila, no more dilution in the dark. Now onto the most important part of the chameleon brush, the colors which can be modified here in the color dynamic section. And right off the bat, we only need to focus on the stroke color jitter to change the color of the stroke and the color pressure section in order to change the colors depending on how much pressure you apply, which is pretty nice. Because the stamp color jitter makes this brush look super freaky and the color tilt, I mean, let's be honest, how many times do we actually tilt our calligraphy brushes? You can see the numbers that I set here, but it's very important to note that you should definitely not go overboard. I know it's tempting to just bump up all the color values because that's when you see the most amount of change, but I think in terms of practicality, you just don't need a brush that has all the colors. So my advice here, always try to keep it subtle, take advantage of the brush preview while changing the settings and I'm sure after experimenting, you'll find just the right amount of color dynamic. Speaking of dynamics, this is the next category. Here we can change the size and opacity behavior with his speed. I set the size to zero, which gives me the most realistic behavior. Slow speed results into a thin stroke and fast speed into a thicker stroke. Opacity I changed to 100% because I want my brush to be more transparent the more speed I apply. Jitter, I set the size to 10%, which alters the stamp size randomly, and that helps with the texture, and opacity I'm going to keep at zero for now. Almost done. Apple Pencil settings, always set the pressure size to max. That's usually the first thing I check whenever I create a new iPad lettering brush, because that's what's going to make it pressure sensitive. The rest we don't have to touch, but I sometimes modify the bleed amount just a tiny bit. And tilt, we talked about this before, but I don't tilt my brushes too often, so this is another section we can just skip over. Something we can also basically skip over is the properties section. I mean, I just keep them as they are for the most part since most of them don't really have a huge effect on the brush itself. Preview is just the size of the brush inside the studio panel, which can also be altered by tapping the drawing pad. Smudge is just how sensitive your brush is going to be to smudging. And yeah, the brush behavior, I just keep the max values at max and the minimum values at zero. That way it doesn't interfere too much with the sliders we have on top of the canvas. And last but certainly not least, the about section. Let the world know that you were the one who created this brush by writing down your name, signing it off, and adding a picture if you feel like it. Oh, and if you are in the middle of experimenting, then I also highly suggest you create a new reset point because sometimes it's hard to keep track of all the changes you make. And for those times, it's great to have a good foundation you know you can always come back to. Okay, so the final brush itself is linked down below. You can get it for free on my website. You can do whatever you want with it. You can modify it, share it with others. Everything's allowed. Uh, quick pause, everything's allowed except for selling. The only thing I'd ask you to do if you do end up using it on socials, just tag me and I'll make sure to share it as well on my Instagram. And who knows, maybe all the sharing is eventually going to lead someone else to discover this video. Actually, another thing I decided to do is to run a sale, 20% off the entire shop, considering the crazy circumstances we have to live in right now. Stay safe, wash your hands, and don't touch your face. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know in the comments, and drop a like if you thought this was helpful. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you guys in my next video.